feel like this hobby is 90% waiting, waiting for good things to happen and then waiting for things to go wrong. If you're waiting for more good things and less bad things, then you're doing okay. I don't know if I'm doing okay. <laughs> hate it. I'm much more of a doing type of guy, but this hobby has taught me that oftentimes you have to do a lot more waiting and a lot less doing. So this week in episode five of the gallery, we bring you three stories of waiting for death. You all know my record with anemones, and if you're new, maybe you don't know my record. Here's my record with anemones. First anemone I ever got was in the Red Seed Reefer 170. It was over five years ago. Beautiful rose bubble tip anemone. Got really, really big, and then shrunk down to nothing and died. That's anemone number one. The next bout of anemones I got was in this tank right here. It was in a different location. It's the Fluval 24 gallon reef tank. Got three small rose bubble tip anemones. They exploded in growth. I had 12, they turned into 12, and then slowly every single one of them started to die. That was my second attempt with anemones, death. My third attempt with anemones was over here in a tank that doesn't exist anymore, my 120 gallon tank. Another friend of mine who's a fellow hobbyist gave me a huge, I mean, when I say huge, when it was pulled in, it was it was this this big pulled in. Rose bubble tip anemone, gorgeous. His theory wasn't that I was terrible at keeping anemones, which was kind of him, but that I just didn't have good stock. So he gave this to me. Well, it did okay for a little while on that tank, and then it slowly shriveled up. I moved it a couple times. I don't know where it is, it's gone. I mean, it was the size of my pinky last time I saw it. Then, anemone take four, this tank right here. I had some anemones from a fellow reefer, moved them over here, they've shrunk down, bought a couple more anemones. I suck at anemones. So let me bring you up to date with the anemones in this tank, which is supposed to be an anemone clownfish harem tank. The first anemones I added in there were moved from other tanks. There was that one rose bubble tip anemone from a hobbyist that was almost dead anyways, it's now gone. And then I got a one rose bubble tip anemone from another hobbyist, it's split into three, and they're all shrinking up, looking very small. One of them is the size of my pinky, two of them are very small but stringy in appearance. They won't hold on to food when I feed them. They don't appear to be expunging their stomach contents at all, but they definitely appear to be shrinking. I also have purchased two anemones for this tank. The first one I bought, I bought a green bubble tip anemone from Live Aquaria. I needed to get to my free shipping level, so I bought it and figured, hey, the tank was stable, it was good to go. Put the green bubble tip anemone in there. Within a couple days, it completely shriveled up lost all of its tentacles, had a gaping mouth, and moved to some backside. I don't know what caused it. I think maybe the lights were too high. Maybe it came from a low light environment and the lights in here were somewhere around 350 par. So they were definitely on the high end. But that one is slowly coming back. Its tentacles are starting to grow just a little bit. I've tried feeding it because I'm not sure if it's lost its color, but it doesn't seem to take anything. So I don't have a lot of hope for that one. Then I bought another anemone. Should I have done it? No. No, I shouldn't have, no. But I did, I bought, it's, I forget what it's called, but it's like a reverse tip watermelon. I'll put a picture of it uh, when it looks beautiful. It's green and it has these little beautiful tips on it, these, these red tips on it. Put it in there, lower the lights, even though I said I would never do that, I did lower the lights to acclimate them and it stayed put. But for the first couple weeks, every single day, it would open its mouth wide, gaping, expunge all the contents of its stomach, shrivel up into nothing, and then the next day it would look a little bit better, but you could tell it was slowly, slowly shrinking. It seems to have stabilized a little bit at this point, but it's still not great. It's still not great. So none of the anemones, none of the five anemones in the tank are really doing well right now. I wanna tell you guys about what my parameters are, what equipment I'm using, what my maintenance schedule is, because every time I make a video like this, I get a lot of suggestions, which are appreciated, but I've actually been talking to an expert and following her advice. Let me tell you kind of what I've tried. Even though it seems like I'm an idiot when it comes to anemones, and I couldn't blame any of you for thinking that, 
I'm I'm not an idiot. I just I, you know how people have a green thumb. I have a I have a black thumb when it comes to anemones, and it is it's one of the greatest shames of my life in this hobby. To be honest, it's I feel I feel nothing but shame with with my track record, and it's embarrassing for me, and it is frustrating. And if anything wants to make me give up in this hobby, it's it's that. I'm not going to obviously, but it's. It's embarrassing. Here are, let's start with the water parameters. Salinity is 1.025 or 1.026. It fluctuates just a tiny bit. Ammonia is always at zero, nitrite's at zero. Nitrate has been between five and 10. I test it every other day, so I keep it within that level. So it's never gotten too high and it's never gotten too low. Phosphates currently are about 0.07 to 0.15. I did have to add a little bit of GFO because the phosphates did spike because of the heavy feeding to point. 2.5 at one point. So I'm regulating that a little bit more with the GFO. Calcium is around 450. Alkalinity DKH is around 8.0. Those are pretty stable. There's really nothing in the tank that's consuming a lot of those elements except for the snails, the conch, and the crabs that I have in there. This light is a max spec razor, 150 watt, I believe. I have cranked these lights now so that at the top of the rock work, using my PAR meter, the PAR at the very top of the rock work is around 175. This friend of mine who's an expert in the hobby, she says you need high lights. So I looked at her pictures in her tank and she uses an AI prime light, which is one of the lights I use on the new tank and I use on a different tank. And so she showed what her lighting schedule was. So I set my lights to that schedule and I used the PAR meter to test. And the PAR was only coming out to about 150. So I was like, okay, so even though that's not really, really high lighting, I wanna replicate what she did. So I did have these set much higher. I had these set to have around 350 PAR at the top of the rock works. And I think that may have contributed to sickness from that green bubble tip, maybe too much light right away. So I have lowered these now to match her PAR levels, which would be around 175. So when people say you need high light, I don't know if they mean more than that. I, I don't know if these lights are gonna be great for anemones. I've heard a lot of stories that sometimes you just need some T5s, you need some supplemental lighting. If, if I fail on this tank, well, guess what? That's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna change up the lighting and try something new. The other equipment piece is flow. I have a Maxpec Gyre 330, I forget the exact name of it, but it is on this end right here, and I have it set to a random cycle up to 100%, so the water flows this way. And it seems to put out a really good amount of indirect flow, so I'm really not super concerned about that either. Filtration in this tank, I have a ton of live rock in here. In the sump, I have a filter sock that I change out every day right now just because the nitrate levels are kind of high. Then I have a Reef Octopus Protein Skimmer, which I've been adjusting to a little bit more of a wet skim recently to keep those nitrates down. Everything that I'm doing is to keep my parameters stable. So I test every other day and then I make adjustments. So I will leave in a filter sock a little bit longer or I'll change it out. I will make my protein skimmer a more dry skim or more wet skim, really just depending on my nitrates and my phosphates. In the sump, I also have a whole bunch of live rock. It was actually pulled from the ocean, so it has all sorts of beneficial bacteria in there that helps seed my tank, copepods down there. I also have a little Little container of Fiji mud that I keep down there and I do have two reactors going right now because the anemones haven't been looking well I have a carbon reactor which I have started changing every week just in case it's being used up and because I don't know what sort of things those anemones are expunging so I want to absorb those and I'm also running some GFO just to keep my nutrient levels to keep my phosphate levels around 0 0.1 0 0.07 to 0 0.15 that's it that's a good amount of filtration, but it's not a crazy amount of filtration. So my maintenance routine for this tank, I do a weekly water change, although because they are not doing well, my friend suggested that I change it more. So I'm gonna be trying to do a twice a week, 50% water change, just because we can't seem to locate what the problem is with these anemones. The one piece of maintenance that I haven't done that is really the only thing that's recommended for me to do that I just haven't done is whenever my new anemones come in, put them in their own quarantine tank and then follow an antibiotic schedule whereby basically for a couple weeks you treat with antibiotics, do really big water changes, maybe even 100% water changes until that anemone looks well. And that that may be what I have to do. I've, I've resisted doing that even though I know that might be best practice just because I don't have another tank set up for that. Is that something I will do in the future? Yeah. It, 
if this doesn't work out, if these anemones don't recover with the 50% water change twice a week, which by the way is 30 gallons of water every single time. That's 60 gallons of water a week. That's, that's expensive. I, I'm at my wits end here. You know, I've done the lights, I've done the flow, I've done the water parameters. I've done everything that I've learned and that I've tried and it's still not doing great. All I'm doing now is just waiting for my anemones to die. Regardless of what I do, I just, I just don't believe that I've figured it out yet and that I know how to care for anemones, which is extremely frustrating. So I'm waiting for them to die. We'll see. Act two, waiting for life right over here is the new Innovative Marine 14 gallon peninsula tank. It's been cycling for about a week now and I am just waiting for it to be done so that I can fill it with life. It's a cool system, a cool tank, really cool next to my desk. It's 14 gallons total. I'm going bare bottom to make it super simple. I have two pieces, no, one big piece of Carib Sea Life Rock shapes and then a couple broken pieces of the Carib Sea Life Rock. What do you do when you're waiting for life? Well, let me just show you what my daily waiting routine is for the Innovative Marine 14 gallon peninsula. I'm waiting to add new life. Here's what here's what I really want to do and that I can't wait to show you guys. I really can't wait to move the two premium long fin black storm clownfish. They're going to look fantastic in this tank. Not only that, but over here I have 10 different zoophrags and I'm going to build a premium, I just say premium, I don't know why, it just makes it sound fancier, a premium zoa rock. And I also have like an egg can frag as well. So maybe I'll make it like a Zoa A can rock. I also have a pink gonopora. I have a pink tip frog spawn, a couple splatter torches, and a whole bunch of other corals. And I can't wait to move them in. I have a beautiful spot right here on the front that's just empty where I have a huge mushroom and I'm going to put the mushroom there. So this tank overnight is going to turn into a living biotope and it should be stunning. So that's really <laughs> what I'm waiting for. Oh, and I really want to get rid of this cloudiness. I know, I know, I had to take out the filtration, the mechanical filtration, especially the filter sock, just because I want that beneficial bacteria not to colonize on the filter sock, but I want it to colonize on the rock and in the ceramic bio media that I put in the back. So I'm just sitting here watching every single morning the cloudiness of the tank, and I can't wait until <laughs> that's crystal clear. But even though I'm waiting, there are Three things I can do while I'm waiting to make sure this tank is ready. First up, always wire management. do is even though it's cloudy, I want to get a sense of where my par levels should be. Because I'm going to make this a softy slash LPS tank, I really don't need anything more than 150 par at the top of the rock. So I'm going to shoot for somewhere around 100 par throughout the tank. That should help keep the algae growth to a minimum. Minimum. That should help keep the algae growth to a minimum while also giving enough photosynthetically active radiation to help those soft corals and those LPS corals grow.
much all there is. So now all I gotta do is wait for this tank to come alive. Act three, waiting for something better. The 40 gallon breeder tank is a hodgepodge tank. It started out as just a simple quarantine tank from a couple years ago with a pen plax hang on the back filter from Amazon. And it was, I believe, a fish only quarantine tank. And the reason I got the tank was because when I had the 120 gallon, I was planning on getting something like a Toby fish. And I figured that in order to quarantine the Toby fish appropriately, I couldn't put a Toby fish in a 20 gallon tank. They needed at least a 40 gallon tank to feel like they had any space. And in case there was stress, the Toby fish would excrete some bad stuff into the water and hopefully the tank would be big enough to dilute it that I could filter it out. But then that 40 gallon breeder tank turned into something else entirely. I drilled it, I've never drilled a tank, I drilled the tank, I installed an external overflow, I think the Marine Depot Elite Overflow. I installed the Marine Depot Elite Sump, 30 inch sump I think it is, by Trigger Systems, which is amazing. I hard plumb the system and it's become a gorgeous tank. Started out as just a cheap tank from PetSmart, I think I got during the gallon dollar sale, I think they only charged me like $60 for the tank, but it's become a hodgepodge. And the reason it's become a hodgepodge is because, is it a quarantine tank? Is it a frag tank? When I broke down that 120 gallon, I had to move those fish. I had some Antheus, I had a fox face, six line wrasse, a couple damsel fish, two hawk fish, and really, that tank is too small. That fox face is so big now, he really needs a 120 gallon system. So when I say I'm waiting for something better, I'm in a little bit of a dilemma. This gallery is growing leaps and bounds, and I'm stoked about that. But with each new tank addition, it takes more time every single week for the maintenance, and it pulls time away from making content. And the whole reason for this gallery is for me to make content. Yes, would I have four tanks if I didn't make content? Probably not. I would have one really, really nice tank. But because I enjoy making content and I wanna share this content with all of you, I like having all these tanks because different things attract different people. And it's just, it's, it's really fun to have and really cool to have and really fun to experiment with. So I'm in this dilemma. I have four tanks. I'm planning on replacing this soon, which will still be four tanks. I'm in talks about building a macroalgae seahorse tank. That would be tank number five. And I do have space over here for a larger tank, 120 gallon system. But I'm nervous about getting a larger system because it just means that much more money every single week for maintenance, for electricity. And not only that, but it just takes me so much longer. I mean, those of you who have multiple tanks know how much time you spend on them. It just takes a very, very long time. But that being said, I can't justify leaving in there the large fish. And not only that, I have wanted to have a fish only tank for a long time just so that I could have all sorts of cool fish. So I could have puffer fish and, and a tang gang, which I've, I've never had, and just pack it with you know 10 Bengai cardinal fish and, and, and some cool clown fish and just things that I've never done before. So I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for something better I really want to take care of those fish and move them, but I have a couple other projects I need to work on first. I'm also waiting for some better filtration. This filtration, the sump is amazing, but I can't get my nitrates down. I just can't get them down. And I'm using this Bubble Mega skimmer, which some people have recommended that I raise up. So I have raised it up and I could probably raise it up a little bit higher. But the problem is, is my nitrates are between point no, not point. My nitrates are between 25 and 30 parts per million, and that's what's changing out the filter sock every day and running a wet skim. So luckily, I do have another skimmer. I have an Aquamax. I forget which Aquamax it, it is, but it's an Aquamax skimmer, and I used it on my 120-gallon system. Rather than wait around for something better, let's actually go find it and install it, which is gonna be a pain because I have to cut all the zip ties and all the new wiring I did last week. I'm gonna to have to cut it all and then reinstall it all. But I think that's the only way with that tank stock so heavily with the corals and with the fish to get those down. So let's go do that project real quick.
The last thing I'm waiting for with this tank is just a better mesh screen. This mesh screen sucks. It is, I, I'm just not an engineer. I, I don't have the skills. I made this one for uh, for the tank before I had the AI Prime light and the Kessel light and the feeder, and now it just doesn't fit. So I need something custom made. I, I do, I need something better for this. I don't know if I need to, to purchase something from someplace like a Top Lids, or if I could do a better job custom making something using those Red Sea corner pieces. If you have any suggestions, seriously, any suggestions for what I could do to make this lid more secure. Oh yeah, because Six Line Rass almost died last week as well because he jumped out. But if you have a recommendation for a lid or a lid kit or a better way to make lids than the way I make them, please leave a comment below or email me at contact at myfirstfishtank.com. I would love to hear it. So pretty much for this tank, I'm just waiting for something better.